Hi, everyone. No slides on this one, so uh, I'm sparing you that ordeal. How many of you have heard of Bitcoin before today's session? All right, pretty much everybody. Great. We're doing a good PR job. How many of you own or have used Bitcoin? Okay, a much smaller number of people. Now, if you have never used Bitcoin, I have a pledge from the other two people who are going to be speaking after me, and I as well will be very happy to help you set up a wallet today. Uh, come see us after these talks. We'll set you up with a wallet. We'll give you a bit of Bitcoin and uh, help you try it out and experience it. Bitcoin is better experienced than explained. Now, I'm not going to give you a Bitcoin because uh, that's worth quite a bit of money right now. I'll probably give you a pound in Bitcoin. And so you think, well, a pound in Bitcoin, what are you going to do with one pound in Bitcoin? Well, what you can do with one pound in Bitcoin is about 50 transactions. And that will just give you a glimpse into the kind of thing that is possible with Bitcoin that is simply impossible with any other kind of system. So what is Bitcoin? I'm not going to try and explain Bitcoin in 15 minutes. I wrote a book that answers the question, what is Bitcoin? It's 300 pages long. It was obsolete the moment it was printed, and has to be corrected and updated every three months just to keep up with what is Bitcoin. If you do get engaged in Bitcoin, you will quickly find out that mostly Bitcoin is none of the things you thought it was. It is a lot more and a lot different than what you thought. Many of the people who get involved in Bitcoin describe this experience as going down the rabbit hole. You get this instant effect where you feel that something special, something amazing is happening. And then you start reading about Bitcoin, and then you get obsessed, and then you start reading more about Bitcoin, and then you start annoying your friends and family about it, and you start talking about it at parties and dinner parties, and your significant other goes, oh God, here we go again, it's the Bitcoin talk. And then you get really obsessed, and you read about it for months and months and months, and you don't eat enough, and you get even more obsessed. That experience has happened to a lot of people in Bitcoin, and the reason is that Bitcoin is not just a minor incremental change. It is not a payment network. Bitcoin is one of the most fundamental transformations on the basis of money. And what is money? Because that becomes the center of a conversation when you talk about Bitcoin. You realize that the vast majority of people don't know what money is. We use it every day, and yet most of us really don't understand how it works. Now, we think we understand how it works, but try explaining it to a five-year-old. And you quickly find out the limitations of your knowledge on money. The average person can't answer more than three questions from a five-year-old about what money is. You quickly get to the question like, Mommy, why can't we have more money? Who makes money? What is it made of? And most parents, after about three questions, will revert to the good old, um, yeah, go do your homework. And that's the end of that conversation. How old is money as a technology? It's not thousands of years old. It's hundreds of thousands of years old. Part of the reason we don't know how old money is is because every archaeological site we uncover has evidence of money in it. Beads, feathers, stones. We've seen four major transformations in the underlying form of money. From physical objects like beads and feathers, to pressed precious metals coming out just about five or six thousand years ago. And then, over the years, that being transformed through many civilizations, including Greece, where I come from. And then we start seeing the evidence of paper money that is an abstraction of this precious metal. And then in the 1920s and 1930s, we gave up on the precious metal part and went for just paper. Very convenient. And then in 2008, Bitcoin happened. And a lot of people will look at Bitcoin and say, well, it's a payment network, it's a currency, it's not really that big of a transformation, but that would be a mistake. Bitcoin is a fundamental transformation of every aspect of money. It is the most abstract form of money we've ever created. Now, the name is terrible, because it, it has the word coin in it, and a coin is the most physical form of money you can imagine, and Bitcoin is the least physical form of money you can imagine. And so that can be confusing. Bitcoin isn't a currency, and Bitcoin isn't a payment network. 
Bitcoin is a protocol and a network-centric platform for recording ownership and trust on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And that's a lot of fancy words, but basically what it means is that saying that Bitcoin is a currency is like saying that the internet is email. Currency is just the first application. If you have a platform that allows you to record ownership and trust, the first type of asset that you are likely to record on that ledger is obviously a currency. That's the most obvious application, but it's only the beginning. Bitcoin is not money for the internet. Bitcoin is the internet of money, and currency is just the first app. Why is it so hard to grasp what Bitcoin is? Because it changes many of the fundamental aspects of money, and change is difficult. So the experience of trying to explain Bitcoin changes over time. When I first started trying to explain Bitcoin, I was faced with denial. People would tell me, well, Bitcoin isn't real money. I read serious scientists writing entire theses on why Bitcoin isn't real money. And yet, I had already been living on Bitcoin for two years. My own personal experience was a direct counterfactual to the idea that Bitcoin is not real money, because if I can use it to buy goods and services, it is money. If I get paid for my goods and services that I'm offering, it is money. So denial was the first reaction. Then we went into anger. Well, Bitcoin is really all about drug dealers, terrorists, pedophiles. Criminals. I had people ask me on air whether I was a drug dealer when I tried to explain Bitcoin to them. They didn't ask the HSBC banker if they were a money launderer, but they asked me if I was a drug dealer. That's kind of bizarre. So what comes after anger? Bargaining. Well, now we've reached the stage of bargaining. Bitcoin is really disruptive. Bitcoin is really strange. Bitcoin is really different. So, let's try and polish it up. Let's try and smooth out the rough edges. Let's make it more palatable to regulators, more comfortable for the corporate boardroom. Beyond Bitcoin, unleashing the power of the blockchain. Bitcoin is just a silly currency. The really important stuff is the blockchain. So now we go through this great marketing whitewashing experience, where we pretend that what we want is disruption. This is the buzzword of the time. Disrupt. We want to disrupt our industry. We want to disrupt our own company from the inside out. We want to change the way banking is done. Really? Great. Let me tell you about Bitcoin. Open. Decentralized, permissionless innovation, completely without borders. Identity and KYC won't do it, can't do it, that's not a bug, it's a feature. Control? No, can't do it, that's not a bug, that's a feature. You want disruption? Here you go. Radical disruption, completely decentralized money with no borders. Well, Calm down there, Che Guevara. We said disruption, but we didn't mean that kind of disruption. How about we take this massively decentralized, completely open, borderless, network-centric, uncontrolled, without intermediaries, and we add a bit of control. Centralize it a tiny bit. Maybe throw some KYC in there. And then we'll rename it the blockchain. And now we can start investing in this stuff. And if you look at what companies are being invested in in Bitcoin, it's the ones that aren't doing blockchain. It's the ones that are doing centralized banking with Bitcoin currency without any effect on the blockchain, without any of the decentralization, without any of the disruptive potential. Bitcoin is not smooth jazz. Bitcoin is punk rock. Deal with it. 
it is disruptive. And the reason it is disruptive is precisely why it's so difficult to swallow and swaddle in traditional investment terms. Bitcoin is the first completely decentralized transnational platform for exchanging value. It has no borders. It doesn't care whether you like the transaction or not. It is entirely based on mathematical verifiability. It is the internet, unleashed, unvarnished, unpolished, and uncensorable. And if you can't swallow that pill, there's a startup out there that's going to take that innovation and is going to disrupt your industry because they can swallow that pill. In fact, as we saw with the internet, when the first tier of telecommunication companies wanted to control and polish and make the internet nice and cozy and came up with ISDN or colored faxing or CompuServe. A few of the third tier companies who knew they couldn't compete on that playing field took the internet and used it as a Trojan horse to disrupt the entire telecommunication industry. They used that early first mover advantage. If you think the Bitcoin companies are going to get a banking license, play nice with the regulators, and do something mild just to be able to jump on to some kind of retail shopping environment, you're missing the point. Bitcoin is about the other six billion. Bitcoin is about unbanked and borderless. Bitcoin is disruption. It's disruption on a scale that most people haven't even begun to imagine. So, if you are in a startup, understand that not having a banking license is an advantage in Bitcoin. Bitcoin solves the number one consumer problem in finance. How many consumers have you heard go, "Hey, you know, I'm with uh, I'm with Lloyd's Bank, but I'm really thinking of switching to Barclays because they they have a robust KYC program." I'm worried that I might accidentally money launder myself, so I want to make sure that I have some nice protection from their compliance department. Consumers care about identity theft, which has become a plague upon the industry. And the reason it has become a plague upon the industry is because personally identifiable information must be collected by every intermediary on every transaction and hoarded, creating these giant honeypots that attract hackers like flies. And you can't protect that information. If you're realistic about it, no one can protect that information. The banks can't protect that information, the retailers can't protect that information, the credit card companies can't protect that information. The NSA can't protect that information. The US government was unable to protect the clearance and background data for giving security clearances. That's all of the information on drug addiction and criminal convictions and sexual perversions of every single person in the US government who got a clearance. And they couldn't protect that information. And you think you can protect my social security number or my date of birth? Don't fool yourself. The only way to protect personally identifiable information is to not collect it. And guess what? Bitcoin, by design, from day one, solves the problem of identity theft by basing trust on verifiable transactional mathematics, on programmable money, on the ability to do automated escrow and transaction verification without intermediaries. And in such an environment, identity is not required for trust. And just there, you have one of the biggest breakthroughs in payment systems that we've seen in the last 50 years. So, what do we do in response to that? We try to ram KYC on top of Bitcoin and say, "Hey, let's collect information on everybody who's doing Bitcoin at an exchange." Guess what's going to happen then? You've got a completely open, decentralized network. 
It's like checking for tickets on two of the hundred doors on Wembley Stadium and wondering why all of the people who don't have tickets use the other 98 doors. And if you do KYC on the exchanges, what you're going to end up doing is surveilling the innocent and the idiots. Because those are the only people who will still be using exchanges. And now you've got a giant honeypot of surveillance information of the innocent and the idiots, and you've endangered the private information of every single customer while achieving absolutely nothing in terms of protecting criminal activity from being funded. Bitcoin is not going to be leashed. And you can't go beyond Bitcoin to unleash the power of the blockchain. The blockchain in itself is boring technology. It's a ledger. It's a slow database. It's Quicken, only slow and distributed. What's really interesting about the blockchain is the possibility of completely decentralized consensus. A system that does not require intermediaries, that does not require trusted third parties, where there are only two parties in a transaction, the sender and the recipient, and there are no counterparties, where transactions are verifiable on their own without appeal to authority. That is the revolutionary power of Bitcoin. That is the disruptive innovation. Banking changed in 2008. And if you think the end result of this will be that everyone will be able to run banking customer service on their smartphone, you're missing the point. A decade from now, a ten-year-old will be able to run the SWIFT network on their smartphone. They'll be able to be a bank and a brokerage house on their smartphone. By the time they're allowed at 16 to open a bank account, they've probably spent five or six years using Bitcoin on a day-to-day -day basis as their currency. Because in a global connected world, credit cards don't work for miners, and they're going to end up using Bitcoin. In fact, we're already seeing this. So by the time they get to banking, they've got six years of experience with Bitcoin. Try explaining to them what three to five business days for clearing a check means. Try explaining what a check is. Try explaining why they have to pay you five pounds to keep their account with you. Try to explain them what an overdraft fee is. While you're at it, you might as well sell them a landline and a fax machine, because they're just as likely to get one of those as they are to open a bank account. Blockchain technology is going to be very useful for banks to disintermediate the clearing houses and settlement systems that offer centralized control over transaction clearing, equity clearing, securities clearing. They're going to reduce the cost of doing those things. They're going to change the financial equation for settlement and clearing on a global basis. But that's not revolutionary and that's not disruptive. Bitcoin offers the possibility of bringing banking to feature phones over SMS. There are more people with feature phones and SMS today in the world than people who have access to clean water. Every single one of these text messaging phones can become a loan origination station, a Bloomberg terminal, a Swift terminal, a banking system, and it can serve customers who have other phones connected to it. There are six billion people out there who have no access to international credit, international liquidity, international equities, or the ability to move money between currencies across borders to do import and export. Those are the restricted capabilities of the privileged few. Bitcoin can deliver banking services not by banking the unbanked, but by debanking all of us. Bitcoin can do that either under the flagship title Bitcoin, or under whatever other name we want to plaster on to make it more palatable. But the underlying invention of a completely decentralized protocol for doing money is here. It happened in 2008. It's not going anywhere. And 
when you see that next article in the financial newspapers that tells you that Bitcoin died because its price has crashed. Is this the end of Bitcoin? Go to bitcoinobituaries.com and add it to the other 150 obituaries that have been written for Bitcoin since 2010. Because one thing Bitcoin does is it refuses to die. It's a relentless anomaly. It's an incubator for black swans. And the reason it refuses to die is because there is no center. There's nothing to co-opt. There's nothing to stamp down. There's nothing to shut down or filter or control because it is completely decentralized. And it takes a while to understand that. If you want to get involved in one of the most disruptive technologies and one of the most exciting technology spaces, one of the most amazing inventions in computer science of the last several decades, the key focus is decentralization. So don't make the mistake of ignoring the disruptive potential of Bitcoin, so you can get some watered-down, CompuServe-like, smooth jazz, soft version of it that feels nice and comfortable at the executive boardroom. Because when faced with strategic, massive disruption of that scale, there are two places you can be. You can be Blockbuster or you can be Netflix. You can be Blackberry or you can be Apple, or you can be Kodak. And that's why Bitcoin is the important thing, not the blockchain. Thank you. Andreas, um, your Greek-sounding name leads me to make the first reference today to um, the Greek economy. Yes. And I noticed in the last few days, if you look at Google Trends, from within inside Greece, there's been a lot of activity, people researching cryptocurrencies, yes. Bitcoin. How could Bitcoin make a difference in a situation like Greece is in at the moment? Well, it can't. Not today. And the reason for that is because Greece is not ready for Bitcoin, and Bitcoin isn't ready for Greece. Greece isn't ready for Bitcoin because the fundamental problem is liquidity. And if you have cash, you don't need Bitcoin. And if you don't have cash, you can't get Bitcoin. So the problem isn't solved by switching currencies. Certainly not by adopting a cryptocurrency as a national initiative, which would be an utter disaster. That's worse than the euro. Bitcoin is about independent choice. It's about people having a safe haven outside of the current currency control systems. The reason people are interested in Bitcoin under these um, times of crisis is because with Bitcoin there can be no bail-ins, there can be no bank holidays, no seizures, no freezes, no account limits, no currency controls. Bitcoin allows any individual to send money anywhere in the world, and it is completely uncensorable. So, in a world where we see these crises, Bitcoin shows us a vision of a potential safe haven. And it's not going to happen today, any more than you could disrupt the media and entertainment industry in the early 90s on the internet. It was too early. But those of us who have the vision can see that it's coming. And one day, perhaps in 10 years, we will see massive disruption from that. And are there any governments today who you think are seriously thinking about Bitcoin and the blockchain? as ways maybe of making their tax collection more efficient or anything else? Are there any governments that we need to pay attention to? Um, not really. And the reason for that is because governments are not the focus of currency anymore. Bitcoin launched the era of non-national currency. And in retrospect, national currency and central banking occupies a very short period in history. Um, there was no national banking and national currencies before this century or last century, and maybe there won't be after this century or after a few decades. But you have to think of Bitcoin in non-national terms. It's not a flag currency. It doesn't belong to any nation. It is the first truly transnational currency. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you.
español, inglés, deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produziere ich nur videos in English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ya algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now already some weeks ago I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I am sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my fir the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, e explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgenden. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o... Mínimo diez o... Mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. 
Bitcoin-Adressen in Papier ausdrucken, ähm, minimal 10 oder besser gleich 100, y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin-Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero. And the next time you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. Or maybe a tip in a restaurant. Oder Trinkgeld im Restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin, de direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen druckt, auch die, äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Adress-Schlüsseln, ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de... Abril 2015, escribir la fecha, más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015. Plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin, eh, en estos cuatro años yo lo vuelvo a tener, tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Ähm, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. 
auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. In mi video an diesen English, Español. Video Mix Number 25, Video Mix Numero 25. This time I want to talk especially about hashtag JCCVW, which I created some time ago, abbreviation for Justice, Court, Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Esta vez quiero hablar especialmente sobre el tema hashtag JCCVW que el hashtag que he creado hace algún tiempo so, que, eh, y es la abreviación por eh, justicia, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, eh, justicia, comedia de justicia en mundos virtuales. I made already several videos about this hashtag. Uh, ya he hecho varios videos sobre este hashtag. But this time, especially thinking of my last video, number 24, uh, Robot Ethics. Pero esta vez, especialmente pensando en mi último video, eh, video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, e ética de robots. First, I want to mention uh, the episode of Simpsons, Treehouse of Horror, number 13. Primero quiero men mencionar el, el episodio. El episodio de Simpsons número 13, Tree House of Horror, número 13. Just a side note, it's uh, astonishing uh, now many years in Spanish TV uh, and at lunchtime and in the evening they are still showing about half an hour or more. Uh, Simpsons, many years now. Uh, es asombroso. Um, ya muchos años que por el mediodía y también por la, por la noche enseñan por lo menos media hora de los Simpsons en la televisión española. Did you hear of the term Simpsonology? Has oído de, del término Simpsonología o Simpson? Simpson, Simpsonology, Simpson, Simpsonology. Maybe I'll check out if it in Spanish. Simpsonología. Todavía. Long story short, the moral of the this episode of the Simpsons: the animals have more ethics than humans. Resumiendo este episodio de los Simpsons. Uh, los animales tienen más ética que los humanos. Remember my last video number, video mix number 24, Robot Ethics, Cat Ethics. Recuerda mi uh, último video mix número 24. Robot Ethics, Ética de Robots and Cat Ethics, Ética de Gatos. And with a funny GIF, GIF is abbreviation for Graphic Interchange Format. Y con un gracioso GIF, GIF. Maybe it's a little bit helpful to compare robot ethics and cat ethics. Tal vez uh, ayuda a comparar un poco el ética de robots y ética de gatos.
once I said to my mom, uh, talking with this person is like uh, teaching teaching ethics to cats. Una vez he dicho a mi madre, mira, hablando con esa persona es como uh, enseñar ética a, a gatos. They just do what they want. Solo sim simplemente hacen lo que quieren. And the robots do what they are programmed to do. Y los robots hacen simplemente lo que están programados de hacer. The question is the responsibility. La cuestión es la responsabilidad. So in the end, you see, it's almost not controllable. Así que verás que al final no es controlable. But normal cats can never turn as evil as humans. Pero gatos normales nunca pueden volverse tan eh, malos, hacer cosas tan malas como los humanos. Perversion, perversión, opposite land, el país de justo todo al revés. Copyright, copy prohibition. El copyright es más bien no un derecho de copiar, sino una prohibición de copia, copiar. Law of intellectual property. La ley de la propiedad intelectual. Especially because I like to produce video mix, I got very angry about the legal system and the perverse law of intellectual property which inhibits innovation and freedom of expression. Especialmente porque me gusta producir video mix, uh, me enfadé con el sistema legal, en especialmente el, especialmente la ley de la propiedad intelectual que inhibe la innovación y la libertad de expresión. And if you continue to think about the legal system, uh, you get more and more doubts. Y si continuas de pensar sobre el sistema legal, vas a tener más y más dudas. But still, you have, I think it's important to have a place to talk about ethics. Pero igualmente pienso que es importante de tener un lugar donde se hable sobre ética. That's the main motivation why I created hashtag JCCVW, Justice Card Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Es la motivación principal por la que creado el hashtag JCCVW, Just, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, Justicia, Comedia de Justicia en Mundos Virtuales. Even on my main Twitter account, Manos Enigma, the cover picture, uh, I've got written Justice, who has the right to judge? Who is without sin cast the first stone? Hasta en mi cuenta de Twitter principal, Vanos Enigma, tengo um, a cover, um, la imagen de cover, escrito justicia. ¿Quién tiene el derecho de juzgar? ¿Quién está sin pecado que tire la primera piedra? And it's astonishing how often the Simpsons show some kind of court comedies. Y es asombroso 
cuántas veces en los Simpsons enseñan algún tipo de comedias de juicios. I want to remember especially the lawsuit or court comedy of Homer Simpson when he sold his soul to the devil, Ned Flanders. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Homer Simpson cuando vendió su alma al diablo, uh, Ned Flanders. In normal legal system, the question is always, is it legal or is it illegal? En el sistema legal, eh, normalmente la, la pregunta es, ¿es legal o es ilegal? But it's more important to ask, is it, is it ethical, is it right or is it wrong? Es más importante preguntar es está bien o mal es ético no no es ético. Did you hear of the term jury nullification? Has oído de este término ahora no sé en español pero eh, uno tiene el derecho de decir que por ejemplo no culpable porque la ley es injusta. You have the right to say it's uh, not guilty because the law is not just, unjust. I want to remember especially the case of Ross Albrecht, Free Ross, hashtag Free Ross, Dread Pirate, Silk Road. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road, Bitcoin, and my profile picture of Innocent Crypto Kitty, y mi imagen de perfil Innocent Crypto Kitty, que quiere decir el, el gatito inocente de criptografía. But it's medical catnip. Pero es catnip médico. 30 years of jail for running a website which other people used for buying and selling catnip. 30 años de cárcel por hacer una página web que otras personas han usado para comprar y vender catnip. And I want to remember what said Roger Ware, uh, Bitcoin Jesus. He said something like, uh, the war against drugs cause more harm than the drugs themselves. Y quiero recordar lo que dijo Roger Ware que es como el Bitcoin, el Jesús de Bitcoin, dijo algo como que la guerra contra las drogas causan más daño que las drogas mismas. Okay, let's go back to even if you would have want to have a person like ah and not just Roger where uh, the case of Charlie Shrin, another Bitcoiner, a very interesting case too, and one interview, um, I made a video, um, very interesting comment of Andreas Antonopoulos in one episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, I think it's the video mix number. Yes, I had just a look at video mix number 17. Justo he mirado es el video mix número 17 con Charlie Shrem. This comment I like too much, so I will paste it. Pasted here. Este comentario me gusta demasiado, así que eh, 
algunos minutos voy a pegar en este momento. can agree to the fact that whatever we have in this country that passes for a justice system has at least three tiers. There are, you know, people at the top who get infinite, infinite forgiveness for some of the most disgusting mega crimes and never face the tiniest consequence for their actions. You can put a million people out of their homes with fraudulent foreclosures, You'll never see the inside of a courtroom. You can rig markets, steal money from investors, defraud millions of people. You'll never see the inside of a courtroom. And yet there's the other side of the scale where you have a situation of zero tolerance, where the slightest infraction selling a loose cigarette for 30 cents gets you a street side arrest judgment and execution by strangulation where jaywalking gets you shot by a cop even if you're unarmed and where cities run effectively debtors prisons where they rotate people through there for traffic fines and keep accumulating them until they end up in jail for violating subpoenas and things like that and run it as a for-profit enterprise. And then in the middle is the middle class caught in this justice system, this thin layer that's getting thinner all the time because they're getting squeezed from the bottom. And the middle class sees the top of this country getting away with uh, mega crimes and sees a wave of zero tolerance coming at them that used to only affect minorities, but now is increasingly taking bites out of the middle class. And they're struggling desperately not to fall into this Orwellian zero tolerance justice system. That's not justice. I think everyone on this call probably has a similar perspective to this, but effectively what we're talking about is an erosion of the rule of law. And the most fundamental concept of the rule of law is equality in judgment. If a law exists, there is one tier. Everybody faces the same consequences for breaking that law. And that fundamental social compact has been violated. And for some stratum of the society, it never really existed. You know, some people were always going to feel the heavy boot of law um, with no recourse and um, suffered under that for 200 years. Uh, but now that is increasingly becoming the vast majority of the population. So you live in a society where the slightest mistake is very harshly punished. That's if you survive the police encounter. Um, while you watch a country's so-called elite just roll from scandal to scandal, from crime to crime with no one going to jail. War crimes, no jail time bank fraud, no jail time. All of these things, you know, surveillance and violating the constitutional rights of millions of people, not even a misdemeanor issue. It just gets legalized after the fact. Lying to Congress, no problem. And then Preet can promote his resume by going after Charlie. It's really a disgusting situation, but I think it's it's a situation that has nothing to do with Bitcoin per se is just a universal collapse of justice and the rule of law in this country. One of the few countries that actually had it. As that was so well said, I have no response to it. I, I completely agree with Andreas, everything he just said. It's 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 not limited to, to Bitcoin. It's a, it's an overall you see it you see it with everything. I mean look at the case of Aaron Schwartz. May he rest in peace, but once they have their sights on you it's you per se i think it's what you represent or who you are um there's no getting out of those sites and the higher up you are the harder it is for them to prosecute you it just doesn't make sense for them our justice system has been corrupted or viewed to, to, to what it is today and I 
I created a hashtag Let's Talk Justice or maybe a better hashtag Let's Talk Ethics I también he creado ese hashtag Vamos a hablar sobre justicia Let's Talk Justice pero tal vez mejor Let's Talk Ethics Vamos a hablar sobre ética After this part of video mix number 17, I will paste a short video comparison of the two uh, websites of Wikipedia about this episode of Simpson Treehouse of Horror number 13. Y después de esa parte del video mix número 17 voy a pegar un pequeño video en una comparación entre las dos páginas de Wikipedia en inglés, en español. I forgot to say in English, in comparison between English and Spanish of the episode of the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror eh, perdón, español ahora eh, comparación del episodio de Simpsons Treehouse of Horror número 13 comparing hashtag JCCVW to uh, the real legal system of course there is no such thing like judgment, rather a fiction punishment. Comparando JCCVW, uh, comparándolo con el sistema legal, uh, por supuesto no hay tal cosa como un, una sentencia de juicio más bien un, un castigo ficticio. Just want to remember you, I have that uh, Twitter account Soul Trade Game in virtual worlds like Second Life with, with Virtual Guide Dog. Uh, recordar que tengo la cuenta en Twitter que se llama Soul Trade Game traducido juego de negocios de almas es como un juego en mundos virtuales como Second Life especially interesting for cats and blind people especialmente interesante para gatos y personas que estén ciegos o tengan problemas con los ojos o people blind or people who have problems with the eyes. Anyway, watch my videos about Soul Trade Game. De toda forma, mirad mis videos sobre Soul Trade Game, juego de negocio de almas. And I have that Twitter account, Soul, uh, sorry, Soul Confiscator Catch. Y tengo este, esta cuenta de Twitter, Soul Confiscator Cat. You are welcome on all of my Twitter accounts. Normally I follow back. Estáis bienvenidos en todas mis cuentas de Twitter. Normalmente sigo de vuelta. So you see, I have a double or triple interest to open hashtag JCCVW. Así que veis que tengo un doble o triple interés de abrir el hashtag JCCVW, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Uh, what I wanted to say before about the jury nullification. Uh, if you really would like to to um, 
participate in a trial lawsuit uh, to help uh, somebody from getting declared guilty fast. You have to take vacation, you have to buy a flight to New York, and I think this trial was in January of um, Free Ross, Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road. So, bueno, lo que iba a decir antes uh, con respecto al derecho de uh, renalification en español no me acuerdo o no estoy segura pero que tienes el derecho de decir que mira yo estoy uh, no estoy de acuerdo que esta persona sea declarada culpable oh, así que primero tendrías que tomar vacaciones comprar un vuelo a nueva york y eh, era ese juicio me parece era en, en enero cuando hizo un montón de frío so comparing this legal system with uh, hashtag jccvw and this is in, in in virtual worlds everybody can participate and talk about ethics right or wrong don't need to buy a flight to new york uh, comparando ahí con el sistema legal no eso tiene que tiene lugar en mundos virtuales no hay que comprar un vuelo a nueva york y tanto tanto esfuerzo para participar en un juicio discutir sobre ética puedes fácilmente participar de cualquier lugar ordenador p2p and especially talking about robot ethics this will be very important in the future y especialmente el tema de ética de robots en el futuro será muy importante. Because it's easy to say the person who programmed the robot is responsible for the actions, but uh, it's very easy to uh, to hide the identity who programmed the robot. Es muy fácil decir que la persona que ha programado el robot es responsable por las acciones del robot, pero es muy fácil de ocultar la identidad de la persona que ha programado el robot. So now I'll paste these, these two videos. Así que... Ahora voy a pegar estos dos vídeos.